last-minute delays, he will become the second man this country has sent on a flight into space. It was Wednesday, you remember, 48 hours ago, that Grissom first entered the space capsule, only to crawl out four hours later when the flight was postponed because of weather. And this represented the second delay in the scheduled flight. So this is the third time that Grissom has been awakened during the very early morning hours and made ready for his rocket ride. NBC Special News Report. Brought to you by the Gulf Oil Corporation. This program is sponsored by Gulf in the belief that the American people want to know the important events of our day. What makes them important and why? And that such knowledge can come only from an objective presentation of facts. The vital thing Gulf believes is that we all need to understand the world in which we live. Today, the Flight of Liberty Bell, live coverage of the second United States man into space shoot. Now here is NBC News correspondent, Frank McGee. The weather at Cape Canaveral, which had delayed the two earlier attempts to make this space flight, had remained marginal throughout last night. At 3.30 this morning, officials met near the launching pad, studied the latest weather data, and decided to go ahead, and they began filling the missile with liquid oxygen fuel. For more details now, let's check with the anchorman for the NBC News team at Cape Canaveral, Peter Hackus. Now, Peter, take five and go. Watch. Once again, you can feel the tension here at Cape Canaveral. After having gone through this suspense twice before this week, the weathermen now tell us that barring further unpredicted changes, we have go conditions for Liberty Bell 7, both here and at the recovery area. The word from Pad 5 is... Booster and capsule countdown progressing smoothly after a brief hold. Astronaut Gus Grissom, the 35-year-old Air Force captain, is inside the capsule waiting. We're told he's still cool and calm, ready and eager to make the flight, 115 miles up and back, to become the free world's second man in space. Peter Hackus, NBC News, Cape Canaveral. Astronaut here at Mercury Control is America's first astronaut, Alan Shepard, whose job is capsule communicator. He'll be in constant radio communication with Grissom during the flight. Also in hand today is Space Administrator James Webb, who came down a couple hours ago himself to observe this important step in Project Mercury. This is Robert Lodge at Mercury Control. Step on board, America's second astronaut. The helicopters are ready to lift off the deck. You can hear them in the background at T-0. Marine Lieutenant John Lewis and John Remick will be the first to see the Air Force captain as he climbs out of Liberty Bell 7. They'll pull him into the chopper by swing, land right to Lewis on the carrier. This will be met by a medical team tested as he stands by the helicopter. Then he will walk across the deck for further examination in the captain's port cabin. This should take 30 minutes to an hour. If all goes well, this will leave the carrier at that time and fly to Grand Bahama Island. 2,800 officers and men are patient with tents. Six vessels of the fleet are stretched out along the range. Dozens of planes are rushing. We're all set. And this is Charles Bassett aboard the USS Randolph. Here at the forward medical area, the weather vanes are still turning around on top of the field hospital building. Medical technicians and doctors are standing looking at the sky and looking at helicopters that are getting ready to take off in case of trouble. The medical building itself contains a real field hospital ready to move into action should any emergency occur on or near the launching pad. The astronaut's personal nurse and the mighty nervous nurse right now, Lieutenant D. O'Hara, is standing out front of the hospital as the final seconds of the countdown tick away. Right nearby are marine helicopters ready to rush to any point on or near the Cape should trouble occur. The hope of these people is that they won't be needed today. This is Richard Bates at the forward medical area. 
Here at the forward observation area, a half mile from the launch pad, the only movement visible is the continuous stream of vapor coming from the lower part of the redstone. There is a blinker signaling a warning to everyone to stay off the pad. Uh, everything is quiet, still, and cleared. The crane is standing by, ready to evacuate Grissom if he should have to leave the spacecraft before launch. That will be removed at two minutes to launch time. The working superstructure has been rolled back. Grissom sits in the capsule, awaiting his climb into the sky, when he may peer through a window that may permit him to sense the climb as he streaks past cloud formations that have been ever so slowly moving over and away. I suppose Pete's doing pretty much what we're all doing, just standing by. The cherry picker has now been moved back, so it is T minus two, possibly a few seconds less than that. It's Commander Alan Shepard, the first astronaut. He is in voice contact with Grissom inside the capsule. He, better than anyone else, perhaps knows what's going on in Grissom's mind at this particular moment. Minus two minutes. It is T minus two minutes. And now the missile stands completely alone. The cherry picker has been lowered and removed. Inside that black bell-shaped cone at the top of the redstone, Air Force Captain Virgil Grissom. This is the flight surgeon, Stan White. The graph in front of the surgeon there was the... Uh, ...down powers in Mercury Control. I will be giving you the count beginning at minus one minute. In about 15 seconds, I will give you 30 seconds, 15 seconds, and count it down from 10. That's Colonel John A. Powers, public information officer for Project Mercury. We'll hear him give the countdown. T minus one minute and counting. seconds and counting. Periscope has retracted. T minus 15 seconds and counting. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, ignition, lift off, lift off. is in excellent physical condition. Gus reports he's picking up a little bit of the noise and vibration. The fuel is go, one and a half G. The cabin pressure has settled down to five. Trajectory reported, go. All systems reporting, go. Cabin pressure holding 5.5. Fuel is go, two and a half Gs. Oxygen is go. All systems are go, and Gus Grissom sounds like a very confident test pilot today. 
trajectory is confirmed by tracking. The reports here in the Mercury Control Center are A-OK -okay all the way. Ground track is excellent. Cabin pressure is holding. Oxygen is go. We're standing by for engine cutoff. The tower. We got tower jettison confirmed by the pilot, confirmed in the control center. We got capsule separation. Gus Grissom has just reported. He is. He has just reported zero G and reported that, boy, that sun is really bright. Manual handle is out. The sky is very, very black. The capsule is coming around into orbit attitude. He hasn't seen a booster any place. He must have lost it. He is pitching up into proper retro attitude. He has manual control of his spacecraft. Our indications in the control center are that his landing point is exactly as predicted. Gus Grissom reports all axes working properly in the control system. Grissom exercising manual control over the Mercury spacecraft now is yawing his craft. Gus Grissom reports that he is running just a little bit late in his work schedule. He reports he has not been able to see any land as yet. Grissom just told me that he was on the window for reference, but he found that it was such a fascinating view, he almost forgot to work. Four minutes and 30 seconds of flight time. He can see the coast, but he says he can't identify any points. He's come back up into retro attitude. The retro sequence is beginning to start. about 10 seconds before he comes up. Exercising manual control and firing the retro rockets himself, we have confirmation in the control center of the firing of all three retro rockets. This is a successful retro rocket sequence done all manually. Shepard here in the control center, carrying on a running conversation with Gus Grissom. Gus Grissom reports he's changing over to the rate command system in his attitude control. We are now running a radio check on high frequency radio. not receiving a very good voice signal at this time. It's very difficult to read. Six, 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 seventeen into the flight. We are not receiving very good voice communications at this time. However, our instrumentation here indicates A-OK. -okay. Now uh, we have the voice communications back again. We're reading him loud and clear on ultra high frequency. He is now moving the spacecraft into re-entry attitude. Like this, fight on. Fight on. Fight on. Fight on. 
And this is a calm, cool, collected, business-like pilot. He has brought his spacecraft around into re-entry attitude, that is, with the big bell shape beginning to point down. System is uh, okay. Systems. Systems, and Gus advises that because the sun is coming in through his window so brightly, he is somewhat uh, limited in his ability to make out any landmarks. Roger. Gus says, I feel very good, and he just reported on the status of his fuel system. Altitude 40 nautical miles. be getting some of the re-entry activity at this time. Oh, Gus says, okay, everything is looking good. Going into re-entry, uh, Sergeant. He has introduced a roll rate, and that's like the rifle, the rifle bullet coming out of the barrel of a gun. And we're still reading Gus Grissom loud and clear. He's reporting a G. He reported nine. He reported ten. He reported up to ten G. He is still coming in loud and clear here. He is at 65,000 feet now on his way down. 50,000 feet, then Gus says, I'm feeling good. 45,000 feet, and clear. He sounds mighty good. Flight surgeon reports that Gus Grissom came through the high G-forces of re-entry in A-OK -okay condition. to be losing voice communication now. Loud and clear here. He is at 65,000 feet now on his way down. 50,000 feet, then Gus says, I'm feeling good. 45,000 feet, and we're reading him loud and clear. He sounds mighty good. Flight surgeon reports that Gus Grissom came through the high G-forces of re-entry in A-OK -okay condition. Losing voice communication now. We are attempting to make voice contact at this time. Our instrumentation still indicates everything A-OK, -okay, and it's not unusual to lose voice contact at this point. an indication in the control center that the drogue parachute has deployed. However, we have not gotten a confirmation from the pilot. Uh, I now hear the pilot again. He has confirmed that the drogue parachute is out and he has a visual observation of it. And as the spacecraft comes down now, main chute deployment indication. We have an indication We believe it is the correct smoke. The boom was heard, and the smoke is drifting away. The beach is the capsule itself, waiting for the drone chute to open. 
paralyzed on this carrier. And practically every man is on deck. It's exciting and it's thrilling, and we're waiting to see if this isn't the proper one. The marine helicopters that took off at exactly T-0, they took off into the sky, and are slipping out to the fourth side of the carrier where they expect to find him. They turn their going forward in this location, and the drone suit has not yet opened as our flight has not picked up the drone suit, although the boat should be fired at the same time. We're still searching the skies. The boom was heard. We don't know what that was. We found an helicopter at this time. We're not identified at this time. The ship is running up flags, and the carrier is continuing on its course. And up on the carrier is talking. The announcement on the carrier and on the circuit is talking. And here we go. So we're watching it in the sky to see just when we can pick up this drone suit. And it should be right over our heads. Very, very soon. Standing high above the carrier's deck here, we are trying to pick out the crew in the sky as is everyone else aboard the carrier. Our spotters and the captain of the carrier on the bridge, we see him. We also see that the light cloud overcast, we've got his clouds here at the sea, a bright sunshiny day. The helicopters are far out to the fourth side of the carrier now. Three marine helicopters and two navy helicopters leading toward the landing point some 254 miles at sea, downrange from Florida. And we're obscured at the present time by a bright cloud cover as preventing us from seeing at 21,000 feet. The opening has occurred. We might return you now to Canaveral briefly for a report from Mercury Control. This is Charles Fossil aboard USS Randolph. We'll be back in just a moment. Our voice communications are very noisy at this time, and that is not unusual when it gets down that low. However, I can hear the communications from the Atlantic Ocean ship, and they are apparently in very solid contact with him. Grissom is talking to the Atlantic Ocean ship. I regret that I have not been talking, but I've been straining to try and hear the conversation between Gus Grissom and the Atlantic tracking ship. And Gus Grissom reports his parachute descent normal. All systems on board appear to be A-OK. -okay. And this cool pilot is now reading down a checklist as he begins to secure his cockpit for landing. He's going through some clouds at 2,000 feet on the way down. Above the USS carrier Randolph, we are just trying to be future. It is descending at the present time. The carrier has put dead ahead into the landing spot of Gus Griffin, the new astronaut of the United States. Well, the Randolph here, everyone's saying it's dead ahead. The cameras are pointing out. Everybody's excited, and the helicopters are down low on the horizon at the present time. Those helicopters will go in, and helicopter marine group, uh, marine group number three, is uh, number 32, I should say, is trying to go in and pick up the capsule or the astronaut himself to choose and elect to climb out of the capsule. Aboard that first helicopter are James L. Lewis, Jr., first lieutenant of Lufkin, Texas, and John R. Remhart, first lieutenant and co pilot from Bloomington, Illinois. Accompanied by two other Marine helicopters and two Navy helicopters to stop from us. And so far away, on the horizon, here comes one of the planes that's been starting the area, protecting the flight area of the astronaut as well. They're moving into the about a mile and a half or two miles ahead of us at this time. We're going to have this in the sea, and we'll try to get the glasses on to see if we can get the astronaut. He has now just landed into the water. He has landed into the water and is down. Receiving the passes forward behind the slightly distance from the carrier, receiving at good speed. We say about 20, 25 knots forward. The landing spot of the. They are making the pickup attempt at the present time. And 
and Greenwich Mean Time. All systems appeared to operate A-OK. -okay. The voice communications from Gus Grissom were clear and effective. The helicopter is about to hook on. We should have a confirmation of the helicopter hooking on to the Mercury spacecraft in just a few seconds. I am not able to make a positive confirmation of lift out, but I do know that the helicopter has hooked on and is preparing to pull Gus Grissom out of the spacecraft into the helicopter. coming from the recovery forces. Shut up. The astronaut is make, completing his readout before he makes egress. He's going to complete it before he gets out of the capsule. I would advise that as a result of communications with Gus Grissom floating in the water, he's told his recovery helicopters that he intends to finish his checklist and make sure that everything is secure in the cockpit before he opens the hatch to come out. And this sounds like typical Gus Grissom. He was not about to do anything until he was sure everything had been done and in a business-like manner. This is McGee back in New York, and a moment ago you saw some pictures of a helicopter lifting a space capsule out of the water. Those were films made of the uh, trial runs, the practice and training for this program, and were not actual scenes of uh, Grissom being lifted out of the water at this time. We just wanted to interrupt long enough to explain to you that that was film and not the real thing. Who is doing his job. All of the people here in the Mercury Control Center are still standing by, 
standing by with headphones glued to their heads, listening for any little bit of information from Gus Grissom. At the same time, they're beginning to summarize the things that they read from their consoles during the flight. The flight surgeon, Dr. Stanley C. White, has earlier uh, in the flight, at about the time that we knew the main parachute was out and that everything would be A-OK, -okay, turned and gave Walt Williams the traditional uh, giant finger single that said A-OK. -okay. Standing by. We are still standing by in the control center for Gus Grissom to wind up his checklist procedures to open the hatch and be lifted up into the helicopter. sitting in the midst of a group of men here right this instant who look very happy, who are very pleased, and who have done a very professional job. We are waiting now for communications from the recovery forces to confirm to us that Mercury astronaut Gus Grissom has left his spacecraft and has come up into the helicopter. I expect this confirmation just momentarily. standing by in the Mercury Control Center. We are now trying to bridge the radio link. is one of the chase planes being piloted by one of the other astronauts. They are on each of these flights set up to uh, keep uh, visual observation of the capsule as long as they can. And this one is, uh, this particular one, I believe, is being flown by astronaut Gordon Cooper, and they're circling around in the area there at Cape Canaveral. ...and into our consoles here in the control center. standing by, waiting for radio communication to tell us that uh, the United States' second spaceman has been picked up and placed on the deck of the ship. From time, from time to time you see pictures inside the control room, and I think you should know that this is a videotape made earlier of scenes inside the control room, because obviously they're not going to... Uh, endanger the success of a mission by allowing television equipment inside a control room at a critical time like this. So they do allow us to make pictures earlier so that when the launch is actually made, we will have uh, pictures to show you of what it is like inside. And uh, it is, of course, an exact simulation of a successful flight because all the scientists and technicians and engineers and the other astronauts go through the same routine, the same pacing that they would go through under an actual flight. That's why you can see, for example, Commander Shepard sitting in his uh, position uh, in, in voice contact with the uh, astronaut inside the capsule. And in fact, when the TV films were made, he was in voice contact with the man inside. Very quick. 
quick shot. In case there is anyone, any doubt in anyone's mind, uh, I suspect that was a fellow by the name of Mercury astronaut L. Gordon Cooper who just chugged by in an F-106. How high, how far, how fast? I need to figure some. I am asking one of our engineers to now provide me with information which will tell me how high, how far, and how fast Mercury astronaut Gus Grissom flew. range indicating that the aircraft carrier Randolph is steaming toward the spacecraft. Get those figures. Waiting for those figures from Colonel John Powers on how far, how far, how high, and how fast Gus Grissom went, we can tell you what he was programmed to do. Uh, he was supposed to go 116 miles high, although our visual illustration from time to time has showed. I think we're getting a report now. Traveled 5,310 miles an hour. He reached a maximum altitude of 118 statute miles. His flight path carried him six nautical miles farther than was planned, and he landed 305 statute miles downrange from the launch site. I'll review those numbers again. The Mercury spacecraft traveled a maximum velocity of 5,310 miles an hour. It reached a maximum altitude of 118 miles. It traveled 305 miles downrange before landing in the Atlantic. are still standing by here in Mercury Control for final information on the time when Mercury astronaut Grissom was lifted out of his spacecraft and the time, if possible, when he was put down on the deck of the Randolph. The figures given by Colonel John Powers would indicate that Grissom uh, went higher, went faster, and went farther by well, a fraction of a percent than was actually uh, planned. And now we uh, go to uh, Charles Batchelder on the USS Randolph in the recovery area. Coming up and into the carrier here. He'll land on the big mattress. They have a rain four on the deck. 
right before it, and also at the present time, the capsule has dropped. The capsule has been dropped by the helicopter, and it's dropped back into the water. Now, whether they can get it again before it sinks or not, that is going to be a major problem at this time. It's capsule source contains vital information, and that information is wanted very, very badly. The astronaut is now on the helicopter, and we'll see virtual system come in here and land on the shore. The jockeys for the aircraft are out. They're ready to bring him in. The capsule itself is starting to come in. He's in the space and found in the helicopter after his jumping from the capsule itself started to sink. We are now out there still searching around for the capsule, and we'll have to see if this helicopter is trying to hold it up. The cable either broke or is released. The helicopter and the astronaut are coming to the ship now, coming up the stern, and oddly enough, on this day, coming through the slope of the ship tunnel here. Yeah. So here we're coming with the astronaut coming to the show. He'll land on the deck here, the forward deck of the aircraft carrier Randolph, which is commanded by Captain A.T. Cook. He'll hold the line operation under the direction here, a rear of J.E. Clark. So here comes the helicopter with the astronaut aboard, and it's see him in the cockpit, you hear it as it lands on the deck here, you hear the sound of its rotors and its head came down. This is the original helicopter that was supposed to pick him up, and in it now we see Virgil Griffin, he's sitting on the seat there very quietly, he's landing on the deck ahead of us, and it sets down safely. The other helicopters have left the scene, so it must have been, none of them have the uh, Liberty Bell 7 aboard, so that must have been left. The helicopter is landing way down in the forward portion of the deck. Not be the right one because it landed in the wrong position on the deck. And let us see, here's number helicopter number 30, which must have fallen. There's a system from the drink. And then it's the doors are closed on this cat's room. Now I was uh, landing in the bottom of the ship. This is the second attack up of a two, three, three helicopters that went off to pick him up. So the first helicopter apparently missed him. The second one caught him. And here he is at the present time. The stopping the wheels of number 30.
Well, Commander, our uh, Captain Gus Grissom is aboard the USS Randolph now, undergoing the first of uh, many and very thorough and detailed medical examinations that he will be given in the next 24 to 36 hours. Here's Colonel John Powers. Grissom has set foot aboard the deck of the USS Randolph. Well, that's the information that you As got you yourself heard, a moment ago from the Randolph. There are people here in the Mercury Control Center who are very, very happy. I'll repeat what happened downrange in the pickup area. We know that the helicopter attempted the pickup of the Mercury spacecraft. We know that Virgil Gus Grissom got aboard the helicopter. We also know that some kind of malfunction occurred. The spacecraft was dropped in the ocean and sank. And this is John Powers in the Mercury Control Center signing off at this time. Well, well, thank you so much, Colonel John Powers. All the newsmen call him Shorty Powers because he's an extremely gregarious and happy sort of fellow, pilot himself, and extremely easy to get along with, very cooperative, and has been of enormous benefit to us as well as you on both of these space flights. We don't know all the details, of course, not yet, but we do know that something happened and that they lost the capsule. Uh, my own communications was not entirely clear. I couldn't hear correspondent Batchelder aboard the USS Randolph too clearly. But from what I can make out, uh, some sort of a leak uh, sprang in the, uh, in the capsule in the water. They got the uh, astronaut Grissom out. They once had the capsule itself hooked and possibly lifted a few feet above the water, and then they lost it. It dropped back onto the water and then went under the water. Um, we had uh, television cameras aboard the USS Randolph. If you remember the last time, we ran into a bit of bad luck trying to make film of the recovery operations. We're never able to show that to you. We had TV cameras aboard this time, and as far as I know, they got pictures of that very exciting and dramatic uh, other end of the shoot way out in the Atlantic around, around Bahama Island. And uh, with a bit of luck, if we got the pictures, we'll have those on for you later in the day. And we're not through here yet because there's a great deal more information that we want to get from down there. But right now, here is a message from Gulf. And speaking for Gulf, Whitfield Connor. Man's need to top his best has never let him sit back and say, I've nothing more to do. Take missiles. The primary missile fuel to date is a petroleum product, kerosene. However, if there is a higher energy fuel to be found, Gulf aims to find it through its affiliate, the Calorie Chemical Company. For that story, here is Calorie's Albert J. Toring. What does a chemist do to make a more energetic fuel? First, he turns to the table of all the known elements. He looks up combinations of those elements that are known to have high energy. He visualizes new combinations that will put more energy into a smaller packet. In his laboratory, he creates a new molecule. He tests his creation on a small scale. And if that's successful, he calls in a chemical engineer to develop a process to produce this material on a big scale. When they are ready, they build a production plant. This one now produces a fuel that pound for pound will give one and a half times the energy of conventional missile fuels. It's liquid pentaborane a tremendous step closer to the ultimate in usable chemical energy. Whether it's pentaborane or Gulf kerosene, Gulf's dedicated purpose is to develop more and better energy for whatever the work there is to be done. To recap briefly, we have had a second successful launching of an American astronaut. Obviously not as successful as the first one because the capsule itself was lost in the recovery operation, but successful in its most important and critical area. The astronaut himself, Air Force Captain Virgil Grissom, was recovered, is now aboard the USS Randolph in the Atlantic and will soon be steaming toward Grand Bahama Island. He is undergoing the first of his medical examinations. Correspondent aboard the carrier said that he seemed to be, from just a visual observation, walking from a helicopter into the captain's quarters in good condition. We hope to have more information for you as time goes on and what actually went wrong and why they were unable to recover the capsule itself. Right now, let's check in with our anchor man at Cape Canaveral, Pete Hackus, and see what he can tell us about things that happened during the launch and maybe have some new information for us. Peter? Uh, Frank, uh, we've just had a report from the carrier, the first report on the condition of Gus Grissom, that uh, he appears to be in good physical shape. Of course, we'll hear refinements of that as time goes along. Um, what I started to say was, uh, even though this is the second time around, and we all thought we knew what we were expecting, the tension here was still, I think, just as great as before. 
the feeling, I think, uh, subconsciously being everything went so well the first time, uh, there were, it was a, a, a sort of a back of the mind feeling that perhaps something might go wrong. Nobody was saying it, nobody was really uh, looking for it, but uh, it was the uh, kind of thing that we had thought possibly might take place unconsciously, and a great relief, of course, here when nothing did. The uh, picture on your screen now, if you can see it, Frank, is the remainder of Pad 5, from which point uh, Gus Grissom took off this morning. Doesn't it, look nearly as awesome now as it did a few moments ago, does it, Pete? That's the launch ring from which the entire vehicle took off. It, as you say, it looks a little bit uh, uh, less imposing than it did just before the flight. I might add one thing. You uh, did hit an interesting point in that the flight, I think, cannot be considered nearly as successful. We have lost a, an immensely valuable part of this thing in, the, in losing the capsule itself. Well, the, Pete, uh, uh, excuse me, Pete, don't you imagine there will there'll be a uh, considerable effort made to recover that capsule? Uh, Frank, I think all the efforts will surely be made, but how you can go down uh, in the middle of the ocean or even at the edge of the ocean and pick that up is something I can't see. Mm -hmm. They may make an attempt. I'm sure they have scuba divers and what all uh, there, but this is uh, something that uh, sinks in about uh, half a second yeah. and at uh, tremendous depth. Uh, inside, of course, we do have, uh, we hope anyway, uh, indications of good uh, telemetry and good readings from inside the capsule here at Mercury Control. Pete, let me clear up one thing. I, as I tried to explain a while ago, I couldn't hear too well, uh, Batchelder down on the Randolph. Um, did, did, did the information that you have there, and don't commit yourself if you don't know, uh, did the capsule spring a leak on landing in the water? Was that what happened, or have you been able to find out yet? Frank, uh, our information here is just about as sketchy as yours. Mm. Uh, I just don't know exactly what happened. It could be that one of the uh, hooks uh, slipped out, uh, one of the rings uh, slipped out, and uh, or perhaps the uh, cable separated. We're not quite sure exactly what happened. Mm -hmm. But inside the capsule was a wealth of information on this flight. For example, uh, there were two cameras aboard. Yeah. Uh, color film, a special high-speed color, which gave them 50% more film this time than last time. Mm -hmm. One of them was focused on... Uh, uh, Gus Grissom's face. Uh, you remember the uh, film we had in color of the yeah. Shepard flight. This was a duplicate of that. The other camera was a, had a twofold purpose. It was focused on the instrument panel itself. Uh, and uh, uh, pardon me, the, the, the camera that was focused on his face was also focused on the panel by way of that reflecting mirror you saw strapped to his uh, space suit. Yeah. So that, uh, that's lost, plus the other camera, which was a straight shot in color of the instrument panel itself. That is lost. All of the instrumentation is gone, and there were onboard tape recorders as well. Now, this is not uh, crucial. I think the flight can certainly be called a success, but I'm sure that the people connected with NASA and the Mercury program are bitterly disappointed. Well, I'm sure they are, but at the same time, Pete, uh, an awful lot of the information from that would have been aboard the capsule uh, has been radioed back to um, to the control center there oh, when yes. the capsule was in flight, so they would have uh, yes, one right. end of it, they'd have a duplicate of it back there, but still in all, it's a sizable loss, and I'm sure, as you say, they must be disappointed. Um, I. I, I found I had a hard time convincing myself, even though we've done this once and this is the second time, I had to make a, a conscious mental effort to convince myself again that there was actually a man uh, on, on top of that thing when it took off. Uh, That's always a, a hard thing to realize, and it, uh, once again here, incidentally, uh, we had uh, the ripple of applause uh, that we had last time, 350 people here at the press site, uh, hard-bitten reporters who've covered uh, wars and what have you, uh, standing by, very tense, uh, perspiring freely. It's not exactly chilly here. And uh, as soon as the word came that there was a successful touchdown, uh, there was a considerable outburst of applause here and a great relief on the part of everyone. Well, sure, I know we, we can regret the loss of the instrumentation and some of the information aboard the capsule. Uh, and I don't mean to suggest that the scientists are just as concerned with the Virgil Grissom as we are. Of course they are. But we can perhaps take their loss of information with uh, more equanimity than they can. And what we're really happy about is that Gus Grissom got out of it and uh, is aboard the carrier. We hope to have more information as time goes on on what happened down there and uh, maybe a little more detailed report on Gus Grissom's condition. But uh, now to Whitfield Connor speaking for golf. This is a toy gyroscope. Lubrication is no problem here. 
This is a gyroscope, too, like the one that guides a missile through space. Lubricating this gyro is a scientific challenge. The slightest change in friction of this bearing, just enough to cause a wobble of one ten millionth of an inch, can force that missile off target completely. Such critical tolerances call for infinitesimal quantities of a new lubricant. Gulf Research is focusing its resources to develop that lubricant. A microscopic drop will completely coat the bearing surfaces and allow the missile to do precisely what we want it to do. The precision requirements are new, but developing finer lubricants, whether for car motors or for the guidance systems of missiles, has always been one of Gulf's jobs. Just as Gulf has always aimed to create better energy products for whatever the work there is to be done. Well, again, to recap very briefly for you, uh, Air Force Captain Virgil Gus Grissom has made a successful flight into space, becoming the second American astronaut to perform that feat. He went 5,310 miles an hour. He reached an altitude of 118 miles. He landed 305 miles downrange into the Atlantic. Grissom was recovered as aboard the carrier Randolph, but the capsule has, at least for the time being, been lost. For any late information, Pete, may we have a brief recap from you? Yes, Frank. Of course, we, we here, too, are awaiting further information. We know just the bare fact that he's down. He apparently is in good shape, and we'll get uh, more detail later. It's interesting to note, I think, that uh, these people were uh, not only dedicated to their task, but determined that this was the day if they could possibly do it. And they, as you know, we had a couple of holes here because of the weather this morning. The clouds were uh, thick and uh, heavy when we first got here. And slowly but surely, as the sun came along, uh, they did clear off and we did fire away. Now, for further information, we switch to Charles Batchelder aboard the carrier Randolph. This is Randolph. Everything has settled down a little bit. The president has called to the astronaut, Captain Virgil Gus Griffin, and Gus Griffin's first words as he arrived aboard the carrier here, and these are unusual. He said, give me something to blow my nose. My head is full of seawater. And he does, as we reported to you, pretty well soaked. Of course, some of that may have soaked down into his suit. He is unsuiting at the present time and also is getting ready for his debriefing and his examination by the doctor. The doctor says he came aboard, gave him the first of those examinations, and that, of course, was given by Dr. Lanning, who is his personal doctor, and Dr. Strong, who is the anesthesiologist. The spirometer test was the one that was giving him measurement of the air that you blow out. Helicopters are taking off in the background. The destroyer has headed toward the area where the capsule itself went under the water. It was dropped by the helicopter. A smoke bomb was dropped to mark the spot. A, one of the destroyers that is accompanying this group here, it is the USS Conway, is over at the scene now. They may try to recapture the astronaut's uh, Mercury Liberty Valve 7. They may try to recapture that from below the sea. We do not know at the present time, but we will keep you, the public, advised. And so it is that Virgil Grissom is below at the present time, unsuiting, and that's a rather long process, it takes 10 or 15 minutes at least, and then he will receive his first physical test here aboard the carrier. This is Charles Batchelder aboard the USS Randolph. Well, it has been a tremendously exciting hour, or a few minutes short of that, with a spectacular takeoff at Cape Canaveral and then a landing that involves some mishaps in the Atlantic. You've seen actually half of it. As I said a moment ago, we have TV cameras aboard the USS Randolph. We hope we made successfully videotape of the recovery operations. We don't know exactly when we will have these pictures ready for you, but we do know that we will have them sometime this afternoon, so I suggest that you keep tuned to your NBC station. And in addition, at 7.30 this evening, Eastern Daylight Time, we will bring you another special report recapping all of today's activities. Thank you so much. This is Frank McGee, NBC News, and good morning. Portions of this program have been pre-recorded. NBC News will present a detailed recap of Mercury Redstone number four tonight at 7.30 Eastern, 6.30 Central Time. Be sure to see the Flight of Liberty Bell tonight, a one-hour report starting at 7.30 Eastern, 6.30 Central Time.
This special NBC News report has been brought to you by the Gulf Oil Corporation, producers of more and better energy from oil. Jack Costello speaking. This has been a presentation of NBC News.